introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today has been on the show before. She is a plant-based doctor, triple board certified in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism, lifestyle medicine doctor too. Her name is Mahima Gulati, and she's going to talk today about role of lifestyle medicine in common hormonal disorders like hypothyroidism, low testosterone, and PCOS. Please welcome her back to the show. It's so nice seeing you again. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to see you again, Chef AJ. It is well, uh, such an honor. And I must tell you, you, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I have learned so much from your show and all the, you know, the amazing speakers that you bring on. But from you, most importantly, you know, you're, you've made my and my family's life so much more better, filled with more plans. <laughs> such a thrill. Such That's a thrill. fantastic. What have you been up to since your last appearance on Chef AJ Live? So I am, as you said, I'm a board certified endocrinologist. I used to work in Connecticut until the summer. In the summer, I transitioned to a bigger academic center in Western Massachusetts. And also I got elected to the board of directors at American College of Lifestyle Medicine in November, 2022. So I have been doing a lot of lifestyle medicine and uh, it's been uh, a rewarding journey. Nice, very good. Is it cold where you are now? It's cold where I am It now. is cold, it is very cold. It is very cold, but at least it's sunny today. It was raining until yesterday morning. So I'll, I'll take the sun. Yeah. And people that suffer from hypothyroidism are often always cold. <laughs> true. That is true. There is a lot of cold intolerance, true. Yeah, I'd love to know more about that because we have a lot of people that actually have Hashimoto's that watch the show and they would love to know if there's anything they can do in the area of diet or lifestyle that could help with that. That would be, uh, yeah, let's discuss that. It is the most common autoimmune condition. Almost one in 10 uh, people have it, particularly women. So it is a uh, important disease to discuss. Absolutely. Well, great. I know you've prepared a wonderful presentation for us. I do. Okay. Well, I'd love to see it. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll hopefully uh, uh, present some, uh, you know, strong science today to your viewers and uh, convince all of us about the importance of lifestyle medicine. Uh, and how people can, uh, you know, use lifestyle behaviors to impact their hormonal health in a in a really powerful way. So let me share my screen. Let me know if you have uh, the, hmm. let's see. Give me just one second. It always works. Before. Yeah, there you go. All right. All right. Can you see this? Perfect. I just wanted to tell uh, your viewers, I do not have any financial conflicts of interest with the materials of my talk today. Like I said, I serve on the board of directors at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It is a large medical society uh, about the specialty of lifestyle medicine. It has over 9,000 members. So uh, objectives today would be to define what lifestyle medicine is and the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. I think most of your viewers know about them, but let's uh, you know, share some data about that vis-a-vis -vis hormonal health and how do our behaviors impact some very common hormonal conditions. I'm going to talk about, you know, the things you mentioned, Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, and low testosterone in men, and also type 2 diabetes, which, as you know, is a super common condition. And then what can we do to seize control of our hormonal health? And then I'm going to share some favorite resources of mine. So what is it and why do we need lifestyle medicine? Um, as your viewers know, it is a uh, evidence-based, you know, completely science-based um, medical specialty that focuses on six pillars, uh, our nutrition, you know, what we are eating and what we are not eating, uh, increasing our physical activity or movement, developing strategies to manage stress in a healthy manner, forming and maintaining positive relationships, improving the quality and quantity of our sleep, and avoiding or reducing risky or addictive substances. So those are the six pillars. And lifestyle medicine actually is a, you know, a field of discipline that healthcare professionals, uh, your doctors, your nurses, your you know, therapists, your uh, dietitians, uh, your uh, exercise physiologists can get certified in. Um, 
So if your provider doesn't know about lifestyle medicine, please uh, tell them about it. Please educate them about this. Um, AJ, I wanted to share this picture that somebody had put on Twitter. And this is actually a real pharmacy, um, you know, in modern day US. So wow. you, know, you see the skin care and, you know, dental care and right there is diabetic care. Sheesh. They have a whole I know, year. right? Whole I know. So, yeah. So when did, when did this like just suddenly come up? You know, this wasn't the case in our mother's or grandmother's generation. And suddenly diabetic care is, you know, um, basically part of our life. So according to CDC data, um, at least in 2015, this was uh, almost eight years ago, one in nine American adults had diabetes. And the CDC projections say that by 2050, one in three uh, American adults are going to have diabetes. Can you imagine one in three? Um, and worldwide, uh, by 2050, we will have 1.3 billion, B as in boy, uh, people with diabetes, most of which is type two diabetes. So uh, we just don't have enough hospital beds, enough uh, insulin, enough medications to, you know, take care of that mass of people. Um, and it is really, you know, this picture stood out to me because suddenly this is life. Anyhow, um, moving on, six out of 10 American adults have at least one chronic condition, you know, whether that's high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, um, you name it. And four out of 10 have more than one chronic illness. Um, you know, as I mentioned to you, I watch your show regularly and uh, I saw Dr. Andrew Freeman, uh, you know, one of a very famous cardiologist uh, oh. who I've had the privilege of, uh, you know, collaborating with on a paper. He mentioned that he never sees a patient in his office who has only one chronic condition. And, you know, that resonated with me because I never see a patient who comes in with just one medical problem. Usually there is a big list of medical problems and a big list of medications. And that is the fact. And that's something to be, you know, moved by. Um, as I mentioned, you know, my clinical practice is a large academic tertiary care center. You know, we have a lot of trainees, we have endocrinology fellows, we have uh, medicine residents. And the patients that get referred to me are typically very complicated and they've had diabetes usually for decades. So my average profile, I work in an inner city um, population and the average profile of my type two diabetes patients is you know, people who started with diabetes in their late teens or early twenties. You know, if they're lucky, they started in their early thirties. That's the standard profile. And this is type two diabetes. I'm not even talking about type one. Uh, keep in mind, type two diabetes is 80 to 90% preventable. You know, we've had like diabetes prevention program, that big trial had been published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. So this is more than 20 years ago. We know diabetes is super preventable, uh, type two diabetes, I mean. And yet, you know, I see diabetes in uh, patients younger and younger and younger. Wow. And many of my, yeah, and many of my patients are people of color, minorities. And, you know, by the time they are seeing me, they're in their late 30s and they're already on dialysis or they've had amputation or um, they have had a kidney transplant. We are a big kidney transplant center. So, um, Yeah. That is where we are. They've had multiple strokes. Um, they've had stents. And we are getting these conditions younger and younger. And patients are getting sicker and sicker at a very young age. So that is unfortunately the fact today. So I wanted to start with the pillars of lifestyle medicine, but I'm going to do them a little bit anachronistically. I'm going to do them based on what I think is where we need most focus. And I feel like, you know, we are an overstressed country. So I would like to start with stress management. Um, I don't think it's just our country. I think as a society, we are a very overstimulated, overcharged, overburdened, over, you know, overpaced um, uh, type of a world today. You know, there was never a time in human history when uh, human beings did not have stress. 
whether that was, you know, predators or famines or floods or, uh, you know, babies dying, you know, so many children would die before birth or during birth, etc. But the way that stress happens now and the way human beings handle stress now is something different. And we are not training our bodies or our societies in how to handle stress. So, um, you know, typical, you know, American families, we are running from one place to the other, from our workplace to our children's classes, to our, uh, you know, weekend events and to, you know, God knows how many overscheduled events we have. But it turns out that, you know, perception of stress or the way we handle stress, um, especially if we suffer from chronic conditions, definitely increases our risk for premature mortality. So in this study, uh, and there are multiple, you know, data points, um, the risk of dying early from, you know, chronic stress can go up by as much as 39% to 51%. So there's a 50% higher risk of dying early just because of, you know, higher perceived stress. Now, obviously stress is inevitable, but can we employ certain systematic practices, daily practices that would decrease our response or perception to stress. So this was a big, you know, uh, systematic review that was published earlier this year in February, 2023 in the Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine. And this is only for patients with diabetes, but, uh, you know, obviously I have literature for stress. I'll present uh, data on other conditions as well. You know, they took a lot of studies and they kind of analyzed all of them. And they found that, you know, different practices, whether that's yoga or mindfulness-based stress reduction or Qigong, they all decrease patients' uh, sugar. If you look at A1C, you know, this is a very important measure that your doctors will use to keep a track of how your sugar control is from, you know, time to time. Typically, it's a three-month marker. And the lower the A1C, the better. Usually, it should be less than six to 6.5 percent if you have well-controlled diabetes. So, you know, things like, let's say, yoga decreased A1C by one percent across these studies, which is, you know, almost better than many medications that there are on market for diabetes, you know, whether that is popular medications like uh, glipizide or Genuvia, even metformin. Many of these medications may not decrease your A1C by one percent but yoga was associated with such a huge reduction. Um, similarly, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction or, or MBSR, that is a, you know, training that people can do for 12 weeks. It's a practice that, you know, people have to train in and they have to practice it systematically daily or a few days a week and learn about it and then, you know, continue with it. These can bring down the sugars or the A1C by around 0.8%. And if you look at the fasting sugar, that went down by a whopping 23 milligrams. That is a huge number, 23 point drop in blood sugar, fasting blood sugar. So this is basically a medication. You know, if this was a drug, if the pharma company had a drug, this would be FDA approved. It would be selling in the market for hundreds of dollars, as you know. So that's about stress reduction techniques. Now let's talk about thyroid. You know, this is a randomized controlled trial from Greece in uh, women. As you know, women suffer from thyroid conditions uh, 10 times more than men. And these were adult women. And they were assigned either to, you know, these practices or to control. Uh, control means they didn't get these practices. And, you know, different techniques, again, like diaphragmatic breathing or progressive relaxation or cognitive reconstruction or guided imagery. And... Patients in the intervention group demonstrated a decrease in the rate change of thyroglobulin antibodies. So, you know, these are antibodies that are present in patients with Hashimoto's. And typically these antibodies mean there is inflammation in the body and they are associated with numerous symptoms of Hashis like brain fog, like joint pains, like bowel complaints, like, um, skin dryness, et cetera. So, you know, Having lower inflammation levels is obviously beneficial. And then there were other outcomes like, you know, uh, women felt better uh, in terms of quality of life by these techniques. Uh, so point is that we can actually train ourselves and our patients in these techniques. 
and you know train our parasympathetic nervous system because you know we are always high cortisol high sympathetic drive but during the day at some point of time maybe towards the end of the day or maybe in the beginning of the day just channeling our breath or some other way some other technique you know whatever works for you meditation you know mantras whatever chanting whatever works for you but slowing down our um you know basically invoking our parasympathetic nervous that brings down the heart rate brings down the blood pressure so that you know we can you know sort of train our vascular physiology to handle stress a little bit better um when it comes to stress i also want to emphasize social media um this is a advisory that the us surgeon general published this year in 2023 uh and i encourage your um viewers uh i'm sure some of them already know about this to look at this about you know the adverse impacts of social media on uh, youth mental health they actually came up with like a tip sheet on how to handle social media better you know ideally younger kids less than 16 year old should not be on social media um and then even if you know after 16 years of age how can uh, we you know handle social media better how can we turn off notifications track screen time and you know track how much time we are spending on various apps etc so let's move on enough about the stress let's go on to uh, sleep you know restorative as in you know both the quantity and the quality of sleep should be good um i just wanted to share a cool statistic with your viewers i really loved these uh, pictures by the way all the you know the pictures most of the pictures i got uh, for my slides today are from the public domain from the internet so you know then and now as you can see you know that's like i guess uh, children are tired from playing outdoors all day and you know they they're sleeping with each other and their dolls etc and now you know there's a lot of screen time and devices but you know even when you talk about adults um an average american adult used to sleep 8 hours every night back in the 1960s and the data in 2010 an average american adult now this is pre pandemic an average american adult sleeps on an average 6.7 hours every night this is the average so some adults are speak uh, are sleeping even less than that uh, but 6.7 so we've lost a collective 1.3 hours of night sleep uh, which is actually very very substantial when it comes to the public health implications of that much amount of sleep loss across the population so so far so good aj i just wanted to make sure i am with you and uh there's nothing's wrong with technology because i didn't hear from you oh no no i'm right here i'm just oh, okay. i just I, i what right. i do okay. is, the reason i mute myself is we get a better recording that way but i'm enjoying the presentation immensely okay all right i was like you know i i don't see anybody so i was like oh my god yeah. i hope i'm right. not i'm like not disconnected no no you you are doing great but like when you said about social media i kind of i i actually glad i was muted because i was just laughing like that's really going to happen <laughs> yeah yeah right that's uh yeah that's uh yeah we have to talk about how we can uh you know make that happen but yes yeah, so let's talk about sleep and gonadal health because that's huge so this is again a very old study 2011 so 12 years ago you know in university of chicago they took a small sample of young and healthy men in their 20s and this was published in jama which is a very high impact uh, you know medical journal prestigious medical journal and they exposed them to one week of sleep restriction at 5 hours every night so one week you know the the boys are sleeping only 5 hours uh if you look at that 15% of uh, american working population actually does face this on a chronic basis where you know they're only sleeping 5 hours at night um within one week their daytime testosterone levels were decreased by 10 to 15% and this is uh, you know if you compare normal aging a normal uh, healthy man uh basically has a decrease of testosterone levels by maybe 1% max 2% in a year so to lose you know and i can actually uh, show you the picture right here uh this is in nanomoles so it doesn't look very impressive but you know this is the time when testosterone peaks when a man wakes up and this is if they are rested and look at the dip when they were sleep deprived 
And then their cortisol, you know, when they are sleep deprived, it's much higher than when they are not sleep deprived. So sleep deprivation can have a huge uh, impact on gonadal function and the production of testosterone in young men. In, in, and then what about women? You know, I talked about polycystic ovary syndrome, which is the most common hormonal disorder in young women of reproductive age. Although I worry that type two diabetes will soon be the number one commonest disorder in both young men and young women. I, I don't think we're very far from that. If you look at how many young girls get diabetes during their pregnancy, but then polycystic ovary syndrome, again, is a condition of quite significant insulin resistance. And um, it many times uh, puts a woman at a very high risk of getting diabetes in her uh, future life. So I don't want your audience to get thrown off by this busy slide. What this slide really indicates is that, you know, women with PCOS have a bi-directional relationship with sleep. What that means is just because they have PCOS, they have that condition where their body has more inflammation and insulin resistance, they sleep worse. And when they sleep worse, their insulin resistance gets worse. So it becomes a sort of a bi-directional. Sleep affects their hormones, hormones affect their sleep kind of a relationship. Um, they've done some really cool studies about melatonin in women with PCOS in their blood and in their ovaries. And, you know, women with PCOS may have chronically elevated melatonin. And as you know, melatonin is the sleep-inducing hormone. So, you know, typically melatonin should only go up in the late evening when it's time to sleep. But PCOS women may have melatonin elevated throughout the day. So they may not have a good onset of sleep at night. And similarly, they may be at a higher risk of getting conditions like obstructive sleep apnea, which can really deteriorate the quality or the, you know, the restorativeness of somebody's sleep. So basically, you know, I know y'all and your, uh, you know, your viewers, they love pathways. So here is a pathway I created for them, uh, which is sun deprivation leads to sleep deprivation, leads to sex deprivation. Um, it is important for us, for our eyes, for our, you know, retinal ganglion cells to see sunlight. I'm not saying stare directly at the sun, but you know, to be outdoors. And I say that as a physician, particularly sun deprived myself, you know, because I work in offices, many of which don't have windows. Um, but it is important to get 30 to 60 minutes of outdoor, uh, you know, time each day for most of us, even if it's raining, you know, going out with umbrellas, because the circadian clock, you know, the, the main, the zeitgeber, the main biological clock in our hypothalamus that trains the rest of our body cells gets its cue from sunlight, particularly in early morning. And then also exposure in the late afternoon is very important in order to transition to that, you know, nighttime. And that is important to have the correct hormonal balance between melatonin and, you know, awakening hormones. So, um, and then of course, if sleep is deprived, then, you know, our hormones will be all over the place. So it's really important to have that as well. What about the thyroid? Uh, again, bi-directional, you know, patients who suffer from Hashimoto's or even Graves, which is the overactive thyroid, they can have restless legs worsened. Now, they, the, you know, thyroid conditions don't cause restless legs, but if they already have restless legs, the thyroid condition can make it worse. Similarly, if patients already have sleep apnea, then having a low thyroid can make that worse. So it doesn't cause it, but it contributes to the symptoms. Um, then like you mentioned, you know, patients who uh, have thyroid conditions may have other symptoms like cold sensitivity or heat sensitivity or muscle pains or joint pains and they may not have, or they may have insomnia, and they may not sleep very well. So having the thyroid condition can worsen their sleep, and then having worse sleep may increase their risk of developing more and more underactive thyroid with passing time. So if somebody has subclinical hypothyroidism, or if they just have antibodies, they can transition to gradually worsening thyroid function if they sleep poorly. Um, Diabetes, again, the same story, you know, multiple 
I tried to bring only the high quality studies, which are, you know, across, you know, basically analyses of multiple studies. And uh, it's clear that the quantity as well as the quality of sleep in patients with diabetes impacts their sugar control, their A1C. Uh, let's go to the third pillar, which is regular physical activity. This is a study from, again, JAMA, you know, uh, high quality, high impact journal. It's a cohort study, you know, so they took Fitbit in adults with diabetes or obesity or sleep apnea. And they did this for a mean follow-up of 10.1 years. And as you can see, the more the step count, the lower the mortality risk. Really, the, you know, the mortality risk drops off a cliff. Somebody is not taking even 2,000 steps, you know, if they are sedentary. And once you improve their step count, um, it really drops. And then, you know, it kind of plateaus off. If So if somebody is already taking 14,000, 16,000 steps, it doesn't improve their mortality risk as much. But if somebody is sedentary and they start moving a little bit, 10%, 20%, that mortality risk really drops. Um, how about the thyroid? Now, this is a study from the, you know, I think uh, some of your viewers, if they are health professionals, may know the NANES data set, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, and this one uh, was from Duke researchers. They measured their patients, you know, um, with, and these are just young patients across population, um, with like, a, again, an accelerometer. So again, a Fitbit or some tracker device. The good thing about these tracking devices is that then, you know, you're not relying on what uh, patients are telling you in terms of, or, you know, their uh, subjective uh, recount of what their activities, you can actually have objective measurements. And they found that active adults had, uh, you know, for the same number of free T4, which is the hormone that the thyroid gland makes, the TSH levels were lower. That means their risk of having an underactive thyroid was lower if they were more active. Similarly, you know, when somebody is more physically active, they had lower CRP levels. That's an inflammatory biomarker. It's also called C-reactive protein. They had lower white blood cell count and lower neutrophil count. That's what you want. You don't want your white cell counts to be high if you're healthy. Daily physical activity was also associated with lower prevalence of inflammatory disorders. Like if somebody was more physically active, that dose response. So the more the step count or the more the strength training, the lower the risk that they will have an inflammatory condition. Uh, again, this is a busy slide. Maybe I should just move over from that. But what this says in women with PCOS, the different types of exercise, whether that's aerobic or resistance training or a combination or high intensity interval training, it improved all of these different markers in women with PCOS. Their insulin resistance, their BMI, their waist circumference, their lipid panels, their fasting glucose. Many of these studies, you know, they had quite remarkable improvements in women with PCOS with these different modalities of exercise. One more thing that I wanted to tell our viewers about exercise, just like about diet, is that, um, you know, we want a variety, you know, just like in a standard diet plate, you want a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of fruit, a little bit of legumes, a little bit of grains, whole grains. Similarly, when we do exercise, we want a little bit of everything. We want aerobic or cardio. We want strength or resistance. We want some balance training, especially if we are older than 65. And we want flexibility training. So we really want to have all of this, you know, like a holistic or a comprehensive uh, training um, so that, you know, we have kind of a over, overall, you know, better balance of uh, different risk profiles. And it becomes more and more important as we age. So moving on to the fourth pillar, the wholesome nutrition pillar. Um, I think... Uh, AJ, I've learned this from many of your guests again and again and again. You know, so many of them like Dr. Greger or uh, Ashley Gerhardt or Dr. Walter Willett. It is very clear that dietary risk is the number one risk factor for early death in Americans. So this was again a paper from JAMA. I think the last time I was here, we had talked about this paper. I didn't have a slideshow back then. 
Um, but we had talked about the fact that one in one American adult dies every 10 minutes because of not eating enough vegetables. So, you know, if you look at the three leading causes, heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, 10 foods are estimated to cause nearly half of all American deaths. So it turns out dietary risk explains 43% of all the, you know, top 10 deaths. It's diet. It's not the fact that we are not going to the gym. It's not the fact that we are, you know, uh, somehow spending uh, more time indoors or whatever else. It's our diet. It is basically half of our debts. Um, and I wanted to go to the, you know, this again is a busy slide, but I wanted to talk about the role of our gut microbiome a little bit, which is very critical when it comes to discussing uh, hormonal health. So, you know, as many of your viewers might know, and this, by the way, this is an intestinal cell. These are, it looks uh, sort of uh, chemistry, but this is the part, this is our colon where, you know, our uh, bacteria live, our gut bacteria live. There are 40 trillion, T, T-R-I, trillion, 40 trillion bacteria that live in our gut. And if you look at how many stars are in the Milky Way galaxy, there are 400 billion, B as in boy. So there are more bacteria in our gut than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and the profile of this bacteria, whether they are you know, pathogenic bacteria predominantly, are they harmful bacteria or are they good bacteria, you know, which are living with us symbiotically and improving our health really matters. And how do we grow the good bacteria? By giving them the right type of food, which is fiber, you know, resistant starch, polyphenols, phytonutrients. So by eating real food, is how we can grow the right profile of bacteria in our colon, in our gut. So now these are the, you know, the intestinal cells. And as you, uh, I'm sure, you know, your readers know better than me that there is this something called leaky gut or the gut barrier. You know, gut is everything now. Everybody is talking about gut. All the scientists in the world love it. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of a three uh, sort of uh, levels of defense. So if you're talking about foreign invaders entering our blood, you know, we have three layers of defense that we have, that nature has placed in our body. One is the physical barrier, the mucin that coats, you know, the thin gel that coats the intestinal cells. Then is the actual enterocyte or the intestinal cell and how tightly they are bound to each other. You know, this is something that they call tight junction. So how tightly are they next to each other. And that really depends on how energetic these cells are. So if you imagine a soldier, you know, how tight is that are they going to be with each other? It depends on how much ATP they have, how much mitochondria they have, how much energetic and young these cells are. And that will determine how leaky they can get. That's the second layer. And then the third le layer or the third level of defense is the specialists. That is your, you know, the high level uh, defense people coming in. These are the immunoregulatory cells, the TH17 cells, the immunological layer. Um, and they secrete like 147 cytokines that you know attack all of these foreign infections. So if people were to eat E. coli or Yersinia pestis or some other pathogens, there is all of these you know, infections going in our body all the time. Our gut is the largest immune organ. And it fends off all of these different invasions. But this gut can get leaky if our diet is not good. And that means lack of fiber. You know, if there is a, uh, not enough fiber coming in, then our bacteria cannot make something called short chain fatty acids, which uh, some of your uh, viewers may know about. These are very important signaling molecules that are telling our, you know, it, it basically has role in everything from diabetic health to cancer health, to depression, to um, heart disease, you name it. These short chain fatty acids are, I'm sorry, are very important to signal uh, the right type of uh, cells to make the right type of uh, uh, connection. So, you know, that is number one thing. The other thing is, you know, if we are eating ultra processed foods, which have emulsifiers like carrageenan, 
or uh, polysorbate 80, what that does is that emulsifies, that washes off that mucin, that physical barrier, the gel on the intestinal cells. So carrageenan is a universal uh, element in ice cream. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the scientists who do science in labs, they use carrageenan to cause inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease in mice. They give them carrageenan so that these mice can get Crohn's disease. Um, so emulsifier basically is a detergent. It washes off the gel off of the intestinal cells. And then, like I said, you know, the tight junctions, what attacks them? So anything that depletes ATP, which is saturated fat, sugar, added sugar, I mean, you know, so again, ultra processed food, all of these uh, chemicals, uh, not chemicals, but components of, a, you know, ultra processed diet will loosen these tight junctions. So now invaders will travel through, they'll seep through, they'll percolate through. And these pathogens, they will produce, you know, something called endotoxins, again, bad chemicals that, you know, will overwhelm our immunological barrier. You know, if there are enough invaders then, and if we don't have enough short chain fatty acids, et cetera, our immunity will give away too. So now you have got a leaky gut and all of these foreign invaders are getting through. So if you have, you know, things like H. pylori or Yersinia enterocolitica, when they enter, they can, you know, tell our immune system, they can kind of mimic our own body. So if they appear to be like thyroglobulin, which is the protein that's found in thyroid, then our immune system's gonna think that our thyroid is something that it needs to attack. So here, the, our immune system, which is uh, you know our protector, is trying to you know fend off that pathogen. It's trying to destroy that pathogen, but in the process, you know it's firing off everybody. So it's starting to fire off the thyroid gland cells. And here now we've got an autoimmune. Auto means self. So our immune system mm -hmm. is destroying its own self, its own body. And that's how we get the most common autoimmune condition, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I'm sorry, AJ, did you want to say something? No, no, no. I'm just listening. But I, I, I love what you're saying about all these emulsifiers because that's what is in so many of the plant-based milks that people are drinking, you know? That is true. That is true. There is... Uh, carrageenan, unfortunately, in certain brands, that's true. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out here is this GLP-1. You know, this is uh, the, all the rage right now. GLP-1 drugs are everybody's, uh, it's the hottest thing on the block. Um, and as you can see, our, you know, our intest there are special type of uh, intestinal cells in our body. I think they're called L cells. They make GLP-1. You know, GLP-1 is a hormone that our body makes. But what signals these intestinal L cells to make it GLP-1 is short-chain fatty acid. So if we don't have enough of that, GLP-1 levels that our body makes will go down. And so, you know, I just wanted to let your uh, viewers know that um, our own GLP-1 will suffer if we are not eating enough fiber, etc. So that is something that the researchers call thyroid gut axis. It is, you know, all the rage right now. Um, you know, multiple studies have linked the lower amounts of vegetables, fruit, unsaturated fatty acids, PUFA, MUFA, uh, fiber, you know, plant protein with higher risk for hashis. Uh, and hashis is the leading cause of hypothyroidism in uh, developed world. In the developing world, unfortunately, it's still iodine deficiency. Um, um, you know, the other concern about uh, having uh, ultra processed or nutrient poor diets is that they may not have adequate amount of vitamins and minerals, particularly the ones that we need in order to make thyroid hormones like iodine, like iron and copper and selenium and zinc. These are very important minerals. They play critical roles in the, you know, the um, formation of different T4 and T3, the steps, you know, the different enzymes and cofactors that make the thyroid hormones. And ultra-processed diets may be very poor in many of these nutrients like zinc. Pro-inflammatory foods, uh, again, I will not go through this, but we just learned how they can actually cause our gut to become leaky and activate autoimmunity. Um, and then, you know, the kind of bacteria that live in our gut also determine exactly how many of these vitamins and minerals are actually going to make it into our blood. 
So we may eat all the, you know, the supplements we want, take zinc supplements, take selenium supplements. But if you don't have the right bacterial profile in our gut, a lot of them may not get absorbed and we may just pee them out. And that is something that, uh, you know, we need to know. Uh, last, thyroid cancer, until recently was the number one fastest growing cancer in North American women. And by the way, thyroid cancer is also the leading cause of medical bankruptcy among all cancers in the US. Um, so they have done, researchers have done studies on you know, the gut microbiome profile of patients with thyroid cancer. And they do see, uh, again, a gut dysbiosis or you know, bad bacterial profile in people, in patients with thyroid cancer because you know researchers want to figure out if they can give you know different bacteria or probiotics to patients with cancer will that improve their risk of dying etc so that was about the thyroid and the gut and then there is you know as if thyroid gut axis is not enough let's talk about the gelding theory which is the gut endotoxin leading to decline in gonadal function and again this one is a picture directly from this paper i didn't make this picture but again, the same uh, you know, components, saturated fat, added sugar, endotoxins getting over inside and killing our, you know, not killing, but attacking our specialized immune cells. So what happens is when these endotoxins make it to the testicles, they uh, cause oxidative stress uh, inside the um, cells that make testosterone and also make sperm. So the sperm count will go down and testosterone count will go down. And also they'll go to the, you know, the organs that signal the gonads to make more testo. They're called LH or luteinizing hormone. And the pituitary, the, you know, the brain signaling to the gonads to make testosterone will also go down. So um, that's how important uh, diet is for gonadal health. In fact, obesity is the number one cause of low testosterone in men, according to multiple, multiple studies. So, um, you know, I wanted to clear out one confusion among uh, the, you know, m your viewers may have seen other channels and there are, there's a lot of noise and, you know, people say, oh, researchers don't agree on what to eat. Sometimes they tell us eat low carb. Sometimes they tell us, you know, eat, um, yeah, have artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners are bad or they are better than regular soda. There is no sort of, uh, agreement, they change their um, statements every five years. Turns out that's not really true. In fact, uh, our Department of Research at the ACLM, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, they looked at almost 80 different clinical guidelines from all over the you know, map, you name it, the Diabetes Association, the Heart Association, the uh, uh, Gastroenterology Association, the VA, the European Society, the Asian Society, the Korean Society, they took 78 clinical practice guidelines from all over the map about all over the, you know, whatever condition, kidney disease, whatever condition you can think of. And what do these guidelines recommend? What should we be eating? 74% of all the published guidelines say we should be eating more vegetables. 69% say we should be eating more fruit. Almost 60% say we should be eating more whole grains. Almost half of them say eat more legumes. 44% eat more nuts and seeds. And then if you look at what do they recommend cutting back on, uh, almost one in three say cut back on red meat. Processed meat, again, almost more than one in four. Cut back on refined grains. So there is a lot of uh, unanimous, um, uh, basically a lot of conformity, a lot of consensus across all different types of specialists and government organizations and medical organizations, they all are basically saying the same thing. We should be eating more whole plants and we should be eating less of the ultra processed foods. There was another page that I didn't have the time to put in here, but you know, basically cutting back on sugar sweetened beverages, cutting back on alcohol, cutting back on sodium. So there is no uh, disagreement across. If you look at the overarching themes, it's all the same. So going on to the addiction pillar, which is you know avoiding or reducing risky or addictive substances. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just you know basically say 
Uh, I think um, I think all of your viewers might already agree tobacco is harmful across many conditions, but people may not know the exact impact on, let's say, thyroid conditions. So um, I think some of you all may know about ophthalmopathy or, you know, condition that can be associated with people who have overactive thyroid. They can have like bulging eyes and tobacco is the leading risk factor to make that happen. So if somebody already has a thyroid condition, particularly an overactive thyroid, they should make sure they're not smoking because they, they can get that eye disease, which is in certain cases can cause blindness. And at the least, it can be very disfiguring. Um, alcohol, uh, especially if people are drinking too much, if they are you know, drinking most days of the week or if they, are, if they drink only on the weekends, but they drink heavily, can be directly toxic to the thyroid cells, to the gonadal cells. It can literally destroy the cells, the hormone producing cells in our um, gonads, in our thyroid gland, in our basically endocrine glands. The other thing is, you know, the different hormones, whether that's cortisol, whether that is oxytocin, which is a hormone of love, whether that's the thyroid hormone, they can actually change how addicted we get. So, you know, if we make more cortisol, if we are chronically stressed, that can actually put, it as, put us at risk of developing addictions. So, you know, if somebody stays stressed out all the time, and they are drinking a little bit on the weekends or social occasions, they can actually go into, slip into full-blown addiction because of that elevated cortisol. Um, this is a study for PCOS, you know, uh, women who were smoking, they had elevated uh, insulin levels, sugar levels, blood pressure levels, testosterone levels, which tend to be high in women with PCOS. They had a higher risk for metabolic syndrome, which is a condition where people can have a higher waist circumference, a higher triglyceride level, which is a type of lipid or cholesterol. They can have a lower HDL level. And even if you adjust their body weight or their BMI, even after that, tobacco smoking puts us at risk of all these. And then this study, even though this was not a very high quality study, this is a retrospective study, but they found that even minimal alcohol consumption in, in women with PCOS puts them at a higher risk of developing liver fat inflammation. You know, that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, now it's called metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. Um, but, you know, that liver fat and liver inflammation can worsen with even minimal amounts of uh, drinking in women with PCOS. And then of course, you know, different substances can worsen sugar control in patients with diabetes. Uh, things like alcohol, it can worsen somebody's risk of getting diabetic neuropathy if they drink excessive alcohol or even minimal amounts of alcohol. Uh, similarly, if somebody you know is um, addicted to cocaine, that can bring up their risk of developing a heart attack if they have diabetes by like 10 to 12 times, which is super high. Tobacco, of course, tobacco and diabetes, it's a, you know, both of them are extremely, extremely high risk for diabetes. Uh, I'm sorry, heart disease, I'm sorry, heart attacks. So again, you know, these substances, they are no good for people who are uh, who are already dealing with type 2 diabetes, right? So let's move on to our uh, last, but my most favorite pillar, which is the positive social connection. Um, I think some of your viewers who are very uh, astute may have already seen uh, US Surgeon General's advisory on our loneliness epidemic from, again, this year, May 2023. Dr. Murthy is great. He's, uh, you know, like my friend Michelle Dalal says, he's a closeted uh, lifestyle medicine doctor uh, because he keeps talking about our, you know, social media and our stress and our mental health and our loneliness. And he's written a book on loneliness, which is fascinating. But this is again an amazing document, 85 page document. And this really lays out the hard data, the outcomes from being. Uh, you know, not having the right type of connections, the right amount and the right type of connections. So basically, feeling lonely or being isolated is a is as much a risk of dying early or having a heart attack or having a stroke as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And that's real data. That's data. I mean, you know, it's not something that's just mushy mushy and you know, touchy feely and fuzzy and amorphous it's hard biological outcomes. Similarly, you know, the risk of getting um, uh, Alzheimer's dementia, 50% higher if somebody is isolated. If somebody is, you know, subjectively lonely, they feel lonely, 
they have a 16% higher risk of dying early. But if somebody is actually physically isolated, their risk of dying early goes up by 29%. Again, higher risk of strokes, et cetera. So, you know, this, again, I'm quoting the advisory document. Social connection is as essential to humanity as food, water, or shelter. Humans have historically needed to rely on each other for survival, and modern people remain wired for that connection and for proximity for proximity to others. So, you know, some of uh, your viewers may know about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Of course, we have our biological needs, you know, food, water, shelter, and our body tells us that we need it. If we are hungry, our body, you know, if we need food, our body will tell us there is hunger. If our body needs water, our body will be thirsty. Um, you know, if, if we need sleep, our body will be tired, right? So there are these cues. And then our body, uh, I mean, human beings, we need a certain degree of security. We need secure housing. We need secure employment. But then there is also biological need for intimacy and connection and love. So, you know, just like our body gets thirsty when it needs water, our body, we feel lonely when we need company, when we need intimacy, when we need to feel someone and see someone. And that is a biological need. And if human beings don't get that, they don't do well. So if you look at actual studies, you know, whether that's, a, um, there is a very famous diabetes trial that's called direct trial. It's from the UK. And that is considered, you know, the master diabetes remission trial. So in that study, they were able to use lifestyle in order to reverse people's diabetes, uh, more than one in three people were able to reverse their diabetes just with lifestyle alone. But the reason I'm bringing that up here is because the number one predictor of who would be able to maintain their diabetes reversal, you know, people can reverse their diabetes. Who maintains it for two years? Who maintains it for five years? The number one predictor was family support. In fact, and that's a you know routine thing that you find across all different kinds of weight loss registries, et cetera. Who maintains their weight loss? People who are supported by their families. In fact, in that direct study, the people who successfully reversed their diabetes, their spouses also lost weight, significant amounts of weight. So, you know, in my practice, when somebody comes to me and they have lifestyle goals and they want to make a diet plan and they want to do like, you know, sit down and make something, some kind of a plan. I don't tell them go on this diet or go on that diet. The number one plan is who is your support? Who is your, who's got your back? That's the number one thing you need to write down because we all suffer from one common condition and that condition is called humanity. And humanity means we'll all make mistakes, we'll all fall. And when we fall, we need somebody to have our back, right? So that is the important pillar. Uh, and this is all, you know, basically extremely hardcore, you know, outcomes data. So this is real science. So I will, you know, conclude all the pillars because I want to share some resources, like I said, in my objectives with these important uh, prescriptive uh, lifestyle medicine, you know, prescription, let's say. Number one, get the phone or the screen or the laptop or the computer or the TV out of the bedroom. Get a standard analog or digital alarm clock. Try to get a minimum of 30 minutes of sunlight. I need to do that. I will be the first one to admit I don't get that, uh, especially on busy birthdays. Ideally, 60 minutes of outdoors a day. And then early morning and late afternoon, because that's when our body needs to know transitions are happening. It's time to wake up. And then again, it's time to wind down because now the time to you know start sleeping, the sleep onset is happening, okay? Um, and then the second pillar, who will cry when you die? I think this was a Harvard business professor. I'm blanking on his name, but he wrote this book, Who Will Cry When You Die, which is basically our you know, solid relationships, our connections. And then it takes a village. It always did, uh, which means, again, how many people are we connected with? It's not just about our family, but also our neighborhood the communities we belong to, whether it's our faith community, whether it's our work community, whether it is our PTO, whatever it is that we belong to. For me, I'll show you my village in one second. Build a systematic practice to wind down daily, which is basically that, you know, that systematic uh, stress, uh, sort of de-stress practice that we need to have. That can be five minutes, that can be two minutes, 
but that needs to be a little bit consistent, at least a few days a week. And then small pauses throughout a busy work day where you can just, again, channel the parasympathetic nervous system to bring down the blood pressure, deep breath, etc. And again, I, I feel like this is something I lack on. I'll be the first one to admit it's not always possible, especially if you're seeing patients back to back, there's barely enough time to go pee in between patients. But again, something to kind of slow down because one cannot be, you know, human beings were not designed to be in sympathetic overdrive throughout the day. Movement is life. Alcohol in excess, more than two drinks a week. I'm sorry, it's controversial, but more than two drinks a week. Tobacco, opioids. Uh, we didn't get to discuss about opioids, but opioids and hormones don't mix well. Uh, you know, opioid addiction is a very leading cause of low testosterone and even low uh, cortisol, etc. And I didn't get the chance to discuss all of that, but that's another day they will inevitably impair hormonal health, all these substances. And then when you eat food, make sure you're nourishing the 40 trillion little guys in the gut, uh, which is basically you know, fiber, polyphenols, resistant starch, et cetera, things that are present in whole, whole plant foods. So it's basic. None of this is, I think, you know, your viewers, I think they knew most of the things I said today. They're simple, but they're not easy. And I just wanted to show you my village. This is the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Board. I wanted to shout out some resources. Uh, Chef, Chef AJ, I told you about them. Uh, these are my, uh, well, I'll begin with the, you know, the ACLM Food as Lifestyle, Me Food as Medicine. This is a free course that, you know, if your um, viewers are watching and they can tell their healthcare providers to go and take this course. This is free. This is only five and a half hours. Anybody who's in healthcare, you know, whether they are a psychiatrist or they are a respiratory therapist, they can all do this course for free. So, uh, you know, you can tell your doctor to do this course if they don't know about lifestyle medicine. This is a website called Gift of Health. This is, uh, you know, some of the wonderful people I know through lifestyle medicine. These are my friends. Uh, Dr. Rayapuri, she's based in Canada. She's, uh, she's got an amazing website of, you know, South Asian recipes. Dr. Potlery, these are all doctors who've been on Chef AJ's show. So Dr. Potlery, she's based in uh, LA and she has some of the best recipes. I know I'm a South Asian, so I love her recipes. Uh, Chef AJ was talking about uh, Simran Malhotra. She's, uh, uh, again, a plant-based uh, board certified lifestyle medicine doctor out of Washington, DC. And she runs her website, coachsimranmd.com. So these are some resources I love. And then some other resources I wanted to share with your viewers are, you know, this book, it's called How Healers Heal. This was made by, I think, uh, a dozen or more lifestyle medicine, women physicians and uh, providers. And, you know, if you want to know about your doctors as a human and how um, did their life journey transform when they adopted lifestyle medicine, you know, some of them, they went through some major challenges in their life. And they open up and they are vulnerable about their stories. So this is a wonderful collection of their stories. I love this book. And I had a few other books if your viewers wanted to look at. Um, AJ, I have, this is one of the best books I can recommend to your viewers. I have a little story about this. I think many of your viewers know Dean Ornish, right? He's considered the founder of uh, modern lifestyle medicine. And um, I don't know if in your chat box, your viewers can write how many of them have actually watched his TED Talk. His TED Talk's like more than a decade old. But in his TED Talk, he talks about his journey. And I think he's public about it, so I can share it, that he was suffering from major depression as a youngster. And, you know, he was in a very dark place. And then he found this uh, Swami Sachidanand, um, who really, you know, brought him to lifestyle medicine. And he's done, you know, grand rounds. And he talks about his, you know, sort of teachings from the Swami. So I wanted to tell, you know, the viewers about Yoga Sutras, which is the most ancient treatise of yoga, the discipline of yoga. So, you know, if they want to learn about the systematic, you know, the eight limbs of yoga, this was a text that was more than 2000 years old, written by Patanjali, but this is a translation into English by Swami Sachidanand. And one of the things I loved in that TED talk uh, AJ, I don't know if you uh, remember this TED talk, but in, in that, you know, they were doing both the Swami and Dean Ornish were doing a grand rounds in one of the universities. And somebody asked them, what is the difference between illness and wellness? And the Swami gets up and he writes on the board, you know, illness begins with I, 
and wellness begins with we, W-E. So I really loved that story from his talk. And then there are, you know, many other resources I guess I could share with you. The last resource is this stress prescription. This is a book from Elisa Appel. I think all modern humans should read this. It talks about how, you know, we can take better control of the things that stress us out. There's so many resources and TED Talks I could share, but I'll stop in the interest of time. So that was it. I just wanted to bring this message today. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that with your audience. Well, thank you so much. And you had fans on today because some of your colleagues who are doctors were typing in the chat. So that's thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. Did you give this at the last ACLM conference? I did. I did some version of it. You know, it was uh, tailored more to a, a sort of a medical audience and it was only like thyroid related. There was not much of diabetes, et cetera there, but yes, yes. Nice, nice. Well, you, you know, the book you mentioned about the, the female healers, I'm trying to get actually all of them to come on the show for like a, a mini summit over three days. So that's what we're working on now. That would be lovely. I really love some of the stories in this book. They really, you know, moved me because you think you know your colleagues and then you read their story and the kind of things they went through. Um, I think it just, you know, gives you um, an idea into the shared humanity. Uh, and yeah, and it's, uh, I personally know lifestyle medicine has been a blessing to me. It is a gift. Um, I'm really grateful. I just, you know, wish I had discovered it sooner. Um, but it was really, you know, wonderful to read about how lifestyle medicine helped them in their, uh, you know, the sort of the lowest points of time. And so, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to come on Audible. I can't wait to listen. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gulati. I wish you a very happy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for vegan doc talk with Dr. Scott Harrington. He's going to be talking about vegan weight loss. I'm guessing you get a lot of weight loss in your practice, or, or should I say people that are wanting to lose weight? I do. I do. Yeah. Like you say, like what they're, they're never, it's never usually one thing. It's multiple things that you see in one person. It, is. it yeah. is. Yeah. You know, we don't have enough time to discuss everything, but I guess, you know, like I said, there are those seven things, simple things. And, you know, you can always begin with like easy changes on the things that are the highest priority. So if somebody's only sleeping four or five hours, that that can possibly be the thing that takes precedence over. Right. Well, just make sure you take time to pee, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very... I will. And I wish I can get more sunlight. I don't know how I will do that, but maybe having a longer break so that I can step out, even if it's for 10 minutes. Absolutely, because we're going to be talking about the importance of sunlight on Monday with Dr. Roger Schwell, because he has some interesting research about how even how it's helped patients that were just not responding, just getting people outside in the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, you thank, know, thank you so much, though. Thank you. It's I so nice to see you again. Thanks. And nice thanks all of you for watching. See you tomorrow.